It's a great pleasure to introduce Sean to you today. An honor, really. Sean got his PhD at Tufts University, and then he went to the University of Colorado, Boulder, to be a postdoctoral fellow with Matthew Scott. Then he went on to the University of Wisconsin-Madison, where he started his own lab up, and immediately started working on evolution and development. Really started working on development and evolution. But now he's uh, one of the best known evolution and, uh, evolution and developmental biologists uh, in the world. And I'll tell you why. So uh, just a few years ago, he transitioned. So he still got his lab in Wisconsin, but he's also the um, director of science education, the vice president for science education at Howard Hughes Medical Institute for the, about the past four years. <coughs> And uh, he's uh, got a fantastic record of publications, uh, primary research publications. But amazingly, he's also co-authored two textbooks, uh, one on genetics, one on evolution development. He's uh, published five books, uh, mostly which are on uh, popular science subjects, mainly in the area of evolution, but one recent one on Albert Camus and uh, Jacques Monod. I strongly encourage you to read it. He's branching out. Um, and he has a long list of one of the things he's doing with Howard Hughes Medical Institute, he's actually producing, he's the producer and director of uh, both videos and recently a television <coughs> program that's airing on the Smithsonian channel uh, through his own personal movie studio called Tangled Bank Studio, which, and the, the show he's doing is called Mass Extinction, and that's running right now on the Smithsonian Channel. I strongly encourage you to look at it. He's got a long list of awards, um, and uh, he was elected to the National Academy of Sciences about 10 years ago or so, and the only other one I'll mention of his awards is the Benjamin Franklin uh, Medal, the biological sciences, and so they give these in a few different disciplines, but previous winners of this, which it goes back 150 years or so, almost 200 years, I think. Some of the past winners were Thomas Edison and Albert Einstein, Neil Bohr, and Stephen Hawking, so he's traveling in exalted company. Anyway, uh, I'm very proud to introduce Sean to you, and we'll hear what he has to say. The title of this talk is Science Education and Storytelling. Sean. Thanks, Bill, and, and what a pleasure to be introduced by Bill, uh, an old buddy in this business. I think we've known each other 30 years, and he was kind enough not to tell some stories of those days, and I won't tell any about him then. How about that? That's a deal. But it's great to be here at UCSD. Lots of colleagues that uh, have meant a lot to me in my career, and I'm, I'm just thrilled by the it's, it's 3 o'clock in the afternoon on a Friday. What the hell are you doing here? Okay. <laughs> so this better be at least fun. Okay. And I really hope it's fun. My, my goal today, and, and thanks, Erilyn, for having me. You got to. She she waited. This is like waiting for you know a bus that would never come. Uh, how long? Two years probably to, before we set this up. Yeah, it was it's been a while. I'm sure they said some things about me, but they still put up with it when I could show up. So here's the deal. Um, this is my you know one of my personal passions as an educator in a classroom and and, and out communicating with other sorts of audiences is this realm of storytelling. And here's the simple take home message. Um, I, I just want to provoke you to think about the role of storytelling and communicating science in all sorts of audiences, even at the dining room table, okay? And you know, rather than lecture you about this, I think the best thing rather than tell you, I just want to start off by showing you what I mean. So here is a passage from a well-known, the number one college introductory biology textbook it talks about the advent of microscopy, the development of instruments that extend the human senses, allow the discovery and early study of cells. Microscopes were invented in 1590 and further refined during the 1600s. Cell walls were first seen by Robert Hooke in 1665, et cetera. But it took the wonderfully crafted lenses of Anthony von Leeuwenhoek to visualize living cells. Imagine Hooke's awe when he, when he visited von Leeuwenhoek in 1674 and the world of microorganisms, what his host called very little animalcules, was revealed to him. Yes, imagine and then start reading the next paragraph. Or,
everything that you can actually see with your eye is just the smallest sliver of life on this earth. Most of life is invisible. We still have this idea that we're the most central feature of Earth. And it's the humans that are the bystanders. The microbes are doing the work. What do you als je dingen zie wat niemand ooit heeft gezien? What do you do when you see things that no one has ever seen before? L-A-Y, lay, u, then, they pronounce it with a V, hoek, Leeuwenhoek. Anthony van Leeuwenhoek. He was a haberdasher in the city of Delft in the Netherlands. And why his curiosity found an outlet in microscopes that is just lost to history, we really don't know. The quality of his microscope was superb. He made some 500 of these small instruments, and only a few of them he showed to visitors. He never told anyone how he made his lenses. Robert Hooke in England, he wrote this wonderful book, Micrographia. The first observations of the small world with lenses. One of the first things that Leeuwenhoek did was look at things that Hooke had looked at. There was a stinger of a bee, leg, I believe, of a louse, the singular of lice. But he saw some things that Hooke didn't see because his lenses were better. It was summertime, it was, it was August. The days are so long that you get a lot of algae growth on water. He called it green clouds. Curious again, he had what he calls a glass vessel, you know, a jar probably, and he filled it with the water. The next day, he put it under his lens, and, and what he saw was green streaks. Among this was all these little animals. And these things were a whole lot smaller, like a thousand times smaller than anything he had ever seen before. And, and I, I think the line is, I confess I could not but wonder at it. <laughs> them in Dutch dierkens. And dierkens, that's a uh, diminutive of the word deer. Deer, D-I-E-R. And which is the Dutch word for animal. What Leeuwenhoek called them was little animals. This was all so new. The word microorganism uh, did not exist at the time. The word bacteria is from the 19th century. And, and that strikes me as, as Adam in the Garden of Eden, who in Genesis named all the animals. It was just a brand new world. And, and he was the first person in it. He wrote a letter to the Royal Society, one of the first organizations to practice uh, experimental science. And they're going, oh my heavens, what is this? At first they didn't believe it. Finally, the other members of the Royal Society were also able to see it. And the rest is history. And so he discovered many things. Sperm, red blood cells, protozoa, and bacteria. Which nobody had ever seen before. He is the first person to see everything he looked at for 50 years. Van Leeuwenhoek wanted to see these things. Well, he saw them. But now we get most of life is microbial. If you look at the tree of life, you know, only this tiny little part is every single thing you've seen. Every higher organism is covered, you know, inside and out with bacteria and humans would not be alive if these little 24-7 partners weren't giving us all of these genes and proteins that our own genomes don't encode. And they have all kinds of fabulous behaviors. Vibrio harvii, it's a marine bacterium that looks like a sausage, and it's very fast. Vibrio means vibrate. And what is amazing is that if one watches them go from a single cell to a number of cells, all of the bacteria in unison start glowing in the dark. By studying this bioluminescent organism, we discovered that bacteria can communicate using a molecular language. We used to think that 
social behaviors were the purview of higher organisms. What we now understand is that bacteria were probably the first organisms on this earth to ever communicate with one another. We're always looking at an unknown world. We're driven by our ignorance, and we're driven by the idea that the world must be more complex than what we understand right now. And that's enough inspiration to do an experiment. Can you imagine being the first one to see your sperm swimming around? I mean, that'd be a scary thing, right? That would... <laughs> I hope you enjoyed that. The, the genius there are two filmmakers, Sharon Shattuck and Flora Lickman came up with that design style. Uh, for those of you with children, that's what you can do with paper mache, um, is make a little film. But uh, what I hope this underscores for you is a, a maxim that uh, I think Rudyard Kipling got right over 100 years ago, that if history were taught in the form of stories, it would never be forgotten, or at least it had a better chance. So Kipling uh, you know, not only knew a lot about storytelling, but I think he was some kind of avant-garde cognitive psychologist because uh, really there's a whole branch of, psych of cognitive psychology that has emerged in the last half century or so called narrative theory and it really examines uh, how we relate to storytelling, to narrative. So why tell stories? And this branch tells us that human thought is fundamentally structured around stories. Think about all the forms of entertainment that we seek out. Think about what we talk about at the dinner table or at the water cooler or in the bar. And we use narratives it's important for science to understand cause and effect and the connections between events over time. And that we learn from stories because stories can present a coherent argument in favor of a conclusion. Yet, as I tried to illustrate in the first few minutes today, we're not teaching with stories, at least not as much as we could be. If you look at textbooks, they're almost devoid of narrative. I feel entitled to say this because I'm a co-author of two textbooks with no narrative in them. Um, and that, what that means is students end up studying fragments of discoveries, you know, not whole stories. Um, you're not even engaging all the students' senses in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in absorbing and being inspired and being engaged with material um, when, when you're not telling a story. So maybe they learn what we know on a good day, uh, but not necessarily how we know it. So um, I would just argue no matter who our students are and what they're going to do in life, you know, we think it's really important that, that, that students know, you know who Thomas Jefferson was or reads a, read a novel from, from Dickens or whatever. I mean, shouldn't everybody have heard and assimilated some of the great stories of science? Now, of course, there, there are other sources. Um, we have television out there. Um, let me share an observation on television from someone of our tribe. Uh, I'll identify him in a second. Excited sound bites from glib white scientists are preferred to actually attempting to impart knowledge about the processes of science, and reenactment is expected to compete with the diaper wearing, hooker seeking, gator wrestling, snake wrangling, bridezilla cash for trash of broadcast television in its race to the bottom. <laughs> Tim White, UC Berkeley paleontologist, and, and he speaks from experience uh, in, in terms of, of doing things on television. So, uh, you know, this, the combination of, of appreciating the potential power of stories to engage and inspire and even to shape attitudes um, and the decline of the qu quantity of quality science storytelling on television um, prompted us to get, uh, and us speaking of, of Howard Hughes, to get into the storytelling business uh, in mass media. And so we um, are involved in producing broadcast television specials and series, and that's the HHMI Tangle Bank Studios that Bill referred to. And we're also involved in crafting short films uh, specifically for the classroom. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about this. I'm just going to draw on some of the body of work out of this to illustrate some general points about storytelling um, today. So um, why tell stories? Well, there it is. That's all right, I'm about to show a clip, so maybe that's going to happen. Uh, film can do some, some things that are better uh, than other media. I would say that you know, they could potentially take students and other audiences into parts of the world where they uh, haven't been or may never be. Uh, they can walk in scientists' shoes, and they can show how we know what we know. Um, let me give you another contrasting example, quick little clip. 
Well, not that quick. You're going to see a lot of footage today. The asteroid crater had finally been found, but important questions remained. Which species were wiped out at the end of the Mesozoic? Which survived and why? The search for those answers led to the badlands of the Dakotas and Montana in the Hell Creek Formation. Its eroding buttes hold fossils of plants and animals that lived during the last million years of the Cretaceous and beyond. When paleontologist Kirk Johnson discovered this KT boundary with its telltale spherules, he found the dividing line between two vastly different worlds. You're looking at a ball of glass that used to be the bedrock in Chicxulub, Mexico. Kirk, how important was it to find the KT boundary up here in North Dakota? If you can put your finger on the boundary like you can right here, what that means is you can ask the very simple question, how was life before the impact different from life after the impact? All you gotta do is look for the fossils below and compare them to the fossils above. And that's what we've done here for the last 30 years. This arid landscape was once a wet, lush forest. Crack open some rocks, and you'll find the leaves of plants and trees that flourished here over 65 million years ago. There it is. Look at that. You can even tell what insects ate them. Holy cow. And see, there's two different kinds of insect damage on this leaf as well. There's sort of a hole feeding inside the leaf, and there's a margin feeding on the edge. Take a close look at the ground, and you can pick up fossils of small animals that thrived in lakes, rivers, and forests. So in my hand, I've got evidence of a turtle, fish, crocodile, fish, and mammal. So, and then there were the dinosaurs. The challenge, connecting their fate to the KT boundary. The clues, their fossilized remains. This is an ankle bone of a small meat-eating dinosaur. And you find these bones, identify the animal, and pretty soon you start assembling the list of dinosaurs that are present at any given level. And the lower you are in the formation, the older you are, and the higher you are, the younger you are, and the closer to the boundary you are, the more we address the question of how long the dinosaurs survive. So this, just nearby, we found this bone, which is a bone of a much larger meat-eating dinosaur, same bone. See the size difference? Right. And here's the exact same bone. So when you find bones of different species in the same layer, they're living at the same place at the same time. So this is the entire story in a leading high school biology textbook written by good people, OK? That's it. Exit the dinosaurs is the title of the paragraph. I'll let you, you can probably all see it. End of the Cretaceous period. This happened according to current hypotheses, probably caused by a combination of natural disasters, massive, OK? All see a little huge asteroid, this produces thing, along with many other things, blah, blah, blah. That's that. Okay? Now, run an experiment. Uh, it, it, go for this. If you step into a class, especially let's think of freshmen, ask them, how, do, you know, do, you, do you know what wiped out the dinosaurs? I'll bet you get 95% or more hands up. And then ask them what the evidence is, and you will get no hands up. Because the evidence has, the punchline's been emphasized for you know, years and years in the popular media, but none of the evidence. It's one of the greatest detective stories ever. It's one of the most important events in the last hundred million years on the face of the earth. But we don't talk about how we know what we know and how we're still trying to sort out some of the things a, a, around the, the KT impact. So it's a miss, to me, it's, a, it's an enormous missed opportunity. If there's a convenient, unpacked story accessible to educators, um, expose the kids to the evidence. Put them in the shoes of Kirk Johnson, who's been out there digging for 30 years in the Badlands to try to reconstruct what happened. OK, now I'm not a lot of preaching, just trying to hopefully just give you little samples of, of what might be done. What else can we do with storytelling, and particularly in visual media like this? Well, film can do some things better than other media. And maybe that's bring home things that are otherwise fairly hard to visualize, and, and especially using sort of the power of graphic artistry. So I'm going to, this is, this is the clip show, OK? So it's, hey, I know it's the afternoon. You guys don't want to, you guys don't want to hear me. I'll try to show you something that's a little more. Slick. Here we go. It's hard to believe when you look out across this frozen terrain that once this was a warm, watery world swimming with life. There's this huge disconnect between the present and the past. 
What we see today is a valley with red and green rocks that are tilted, stacked one on top of the other. But that's not how it was in the past. These valleys have been carved by glaciers that have moved back and forth. And those red and green rocks actually at one point extended across the valley. And they were straight, they weren't tilted. Now look inside the rocks and what those rocks tell us that this valley 375 million years ago was a giant floodplain. And that floodplain was filled with rivers that swelled their banks and sometimes shrunk, but in those conditions formed swamps and streams of all different sizes. And inside those streams was diverse life. Including, we suspected, a fish with features that would ultimately enable animals to walk on land. But even if it had been there, could we find evidence of it buried on one of the nameless hillsides that had built up and eroded over the past 375 million years? To find out, you can watch here in a fish. So this is, uh, this is a clip from a, th a three-part series that uh, we produced for PBS last spring. It's streaming now on Netflix. It'll be streaming for free on HHMI Biointeractive in the spring. But that was, uh, you may recognize, was he here last week, as I heard? Neil, yeah, it's a tough act to follow. Uh, so yeah, um, that was the series hosted by Neil Shubin. What else can we do with story? Um, you can go in some other directions. Again, from narrative theory, we understand, and this is what we all seek out in the movie theater, um, the principle of immersion, where, where we get immersed in a story and we're transported as readers or viewers or listeners into the world of the story, and then begin to share the motivations and emotions with a protagonist. I mean, this is just something that, this is what makes us human, right? That we actually feel things through the experiences of other humans. And this immersion experience is very powerful. It's very clear that this can shape and can even change beliefs and attitudes. So why might it be important to tell stories, and in particular, certain perspectives on certain stories? Let me give you another example from a different realm of science. This is a clip from a show, uh, a Nova show from this fall. Autism is one of the most baffling health issues of our generation. Around one in 70 children are diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder in the U.S. today. It's not a single disease, but rather a complex web of disorders marked by communication difficulties and repetitive behaviors. The question is, what causes it? Hi, brown bear, brown bear. That's a teddy bear. You hold my hand. This beautiful girl is my daughter, Jody. She's 16, and she has autism, and now she's in residential placement. And I'm here today, as I am every weekend, visiting her. It's the highlight of my week. As a parent, I would it's love to really, have a better understanding of why she yeah, behaves the way she behaves, really, or why we have to go through the same rituals really and routines every Jody single time. We need to understand so that we can help her. Alison Singer channeled her need for answers, becoming an autism advocate, raising funds for research. Alison noticed Jody's symptoms around the same time as her daughter had her vaccinations. So she, like many parents, suspected there could be a link. Clearly, children were getting more vaccines than we had gotten when we were born, and more and more children were being diagnosed with autism. So I felt that, yes, this was an area that we needed to look at and see if there was a relationship between vaccines and autism. In 1998, an English doctor, Andrew Wakefield, argued there was a link between autism and MMR, the measles, mumps, and rubella vaccine. His study of 12 children was published in a major medical journal, The Lancet. When I read that, I was taken aback. We have to look at this. Fortunately, those are studies that can be done. A search began to see if a link between autism and the MMR vaccine could be confirmed. Scientists examined the medical records of hundreds of thousands of children. But study after study revealed that whether the children were vaccinated or not, the rates of autism were the same. No one could replicate Andrew Wakefield's findings. Eventually, that study was shown to be fraudulent and it was withdrawn. 
Similar studies failed to find any link between autism and a mercury-based preservative called thimerosal. Still other studies failed to find any link between autism and the number or timing of vaccines. So at this point, it's not like we have one study or two studies or five studies. We have dozens of studies. I think we were right to look at whether vaccines might be a cause of autism, but there comes a point where there's so much evidence, none of which shows any link between vaccines and autism, that you have to say, enough. So that's a segment from a, uh, an hour NOVA that's, uh, if you want to look at it uh, in detail, it's streaming for free on the NOVA website uh, called Vaccines Calling the Shots. So in that particular case, uh, Allison Singer, uh, a, quite a um, devoted and, and brave person, you know, is on camera there telling her own story of her own daughter and the journey she took to try to understand that. And the filmmaker's decision was that this was a more powerful way to convey what we currently understood from epidemiological studies than to put scientists in white coats, you know, saying no, 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 no. So just something for you to ponder about the perspective uh, that's told in a particular story in approaching a particular issue. And I understand that right here in Southern California, uh, this issue is a little hot if you're going to Disneyland this weekend. Um, <laughs> or CVS, or Target, or all the other places where people picked up measles recently. Um, so let me shift gears a little bit and talk about specifically the classroom. I showed you some things from general broadcast, but um, the, the, the two parts, there's a second prong to this strategy of bringing stories into the classroom. And I want to tell you specifically some of the thinking and motivation that goes into that. Uh, well, like the motivation that goes in, if I'm being incredibly honest, uh, shows up all the time. I'll just give you an example. I don't, believe, I don't believe a creature crawled out of the sea and became a human being one day. I think there's an adaptation. And, 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 and fossils were put on Earth to test them in space. I'm not well, the person that's Where's the missing link? Where's the missing link in all this fossil? I just want to know what it is. If it happened over millions and millions of years, there should be lots of fossil evidence. Well, there, 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 is, well, there is lots of fossil evidence. Mm -hmm. We haven't found them all. They didn't wave up out from the and say, here I am, here's the one that you... But there well, certainly is an... I know there is adaptation, and there is a difference between adaptation you, and... I've read that six... Will help me out anytime you want, but... Yeah. I'm sorry, I believe in evolution. <laughs> so, um, so the congressman from Georgia, you know, I, I think, just simply put, I mean, you know, I, I think... You know, here he is saying, you know, where, where are those fossils? I, I would just bet hands down, he just never was exposed to them. Uh, you know, that, that they do in fact exist and, and maybe, maybe his remarks on Bill Maher would be a little bit different. Um, so given that the sense that certainly in the realm of evolution, there's, there has been chronically over the decades underexposure to the material, that's you know, one of the curriculum areas that could use some some help. So why tell stories in the classroom? Well, first of all, for the reasons I told you about how stories help us connect cause and effect, events over time, shape our thinking, lead it, help us understand how people reach conclusions about things. That's just good educational pedagogy. It's, um, but also because younger people, um, their beliefs and attitudes are still malleable, we hope. I guess that's why we have schools and colleges. Um, and societal change, uh, long-term fact, is, is driven by the next generations. So let me amplify that a little bit. Let me give you just an ounce of hope. Uh, maybe this is, this is the kind of hope at least I need to, to, to get up in the morning. Um, so here's a recent uh, Pew survey about attitudes towards evolution. And all I want to highlight are some demographic differences in answering questions like, you know, has, have humans evolved over time? And if you look at the 65 and older audience and you look at the under 30 audience, there's about a 20 point gap. On questions like this. This also this holds for other questions, for example, about climate change. I'd like to think some ounce of this difference might be exposure to evidence. Older Americans have simply not been exposed either because of deliberate gaps in the curriculum or, in fact, lack of information that we had, you know, 40 years ago to what we know now. So maybe at least there's the potential of driving the acceptance of evolution up towards 70% or so. I think there is a uh, irreconcilable group, but nonetheless, let's make the gains where we can make it. Um, when you think about this, let me think about this in, in, in more numerical terms. Right now, at this very moment, 
uh, well, there, every, every year, more than 4 million 18-year-olds become eligible voters. There's a similar number enrolled in high school and college biology classes, perhaps a little higher than that. Almost 5 million uh, kids are in a biology class at a given moment. Um, and every year, 2.5 million older people die. <laughs> so in 10 years, that's a, that's a turnover of 75 million. That's something we can work with, OK? So uh, that's the demographics. OK. So, so demographics are our are, are favor change here. We just have to kind of keep trying. So how do we try? Well, for the classroom, uh, we, and I'm speaking now of HHMI, but in general, one, one wants to decide what, what's our priority with respect to anything that's going to be uh, content for the curriculum. Well, we think scientific importance, it's got to be key to the curriculum. Teachers are very, very busy. Whether you're talking about college profs or high school biology teachers, Teachers are very busy. They, they have to have things that, that address their needs and goals. Um, criteria's got to be a great story. Look, not every piece of science is a great story, OK? We don't want to make army instructional films, all right? How to, you know, how to break down your weapon or uh, other army instructional films that I saw a long time ago. Um, memorable. What do we mean by a story? Memorable. It turns out you know, if you take people to a certain part of the world and they encounter a particular creature, that can be sticky. That's an adventure. You know, that's better than most people's vacations, right? So that's story plus mem being memorable. Illustrate the scientific process. That's a non-negotiable item. We got to always break it down and unpack the scientific process. Making and testing hypotheses, examining evidence, interpreting that evidence, that's got to really be part of the story. Visually engaging is important. So we employ, for example, professional documentarians and animators to try to make these things as visually engaging as possible. But here's the key. You can do all that. And it won't matter. You'll get no uptake in the classroom unless it's a basis for further learning, unless it's a jumping off point for doing more with the content, other related materials. So for example, with all of our films, we provide a lot of classroom ready materials. These could be uh, yet further narrative to read. Uh, these could be virtual labs, apps, uh, other animations, um, group activities to explore particular concepts, et cetera. And think about the difference. And this is, you know, I'm now confessing publicly you know, my strategy here, which is if I, if I only had the tool of broadcast television to try to reach 22 and unders, first of all, uh, they're probably not watching it. Second of all, they got their cell phone in one hand, right, and the clicker in the other hand, and maybe, uh, you know, the Xbox controller in their third hand. How, how would that work? Okay. Um, but in the classroom, you know, they're engaged with a, with a professional educator in, in, the, in the classroom and others to interact with and to work with in groups, et cetera. So that's a much better environment, I think, for encountering stories um, than the living room or the, or the basement. But there's got to be additional support to make this curriculum content. So we've made a, a, a bunch of short films, and that's what I've shown you is clips from a few of these things. Um, Shock of all shocks, uh, a big chunk of the catalog has, has emphasized evolution, and that's really by demand from the teachers. They said to us, we really need things, for example, that emphasize speciation or the fossil record, uh, things like that. And um, so this is a, a catalog. You can find it at hhmibiointeractive.org. I didn't come here as a commercial. I came here because, in fact, everywhere I go, I find out that most people don't know that these materials are available. They're all free. You can, if you need them in DVD form, you can request them. You'll get them shipped to you for free. If you want to download them, stream them, that's all available. All the PDFs, everything else, it's all made for free. HHMI is a philanthropy. And so that's what guides um, our mission. So uh, OK, so we've made some of this stuff. And you should probably be thinking some critical questions of, does it even matter? Um, so we, we, have, uh, we have various ways to evaluate these things. I'll show, uh, I'm, you know, I think it's kind of dry to show statistics, so I'll show you some more anecdotal evidence. So here's a letter I got from a kid in Oregon. Dear Sean Carroll, your movie was pretty badass. <laughs> I liked how it showed the struggle of finding out the answer to the end of the Mesozoic era, as well as the struggle for acceptance. I also liked how it showed the search for the crater. I'm probably going to be famous one day, so keep this paper with my signature. It'll be worth enough to make another dinosaur movie. <laughs> that was worth the whole endeavor, wasn't it? All right. But I think maybe the pleasant surprise, so our hypothesis was that you know, if, if we made this sort of content, teachers would use it. I'm happy to report that tens of thousands of teachers have adopted these things in there. They literally have been seen by a few million kids in the first couple of years of being available. Um, 
but you know, people ask me about age ranges, et cetera, and I think we often underestimate um, the curiosity and the capability of kids to understand things, to, be, to at least be interested in things. Even if a little bit goes over their head, they sort of understand that, hey, they're kind of getting a glimpse into you know, even a little bit more of the adult world or an older kid's world, whatever that might be. So to kind of illustrate that point, I don't know if Neil showed you this, because um, this is Neil Shubin starring in another clip, and if you saw this last week, I, I apologize, but I think it's a wonderful little segment um, that illustrates just um, how curious uh, and, and, and the potential for science it, at, it starts at a very young age. And this is Neil. Tiktaalik was headline news the day it was described in 2006. And I remember going in to drop one of my kids off at school. And the teacher asked me, he said, you know, I read about your discovery in the newspaper. Can you, can you bring it in to show the, show the children? So, you know, my office was just down the block. So I, I grabbed a cast of the fossil and, and came in to show the fossil to the, to the children. And it was amazing what I saw. Hey guys, how are you? Hi guys. Hi Han, how you doing baby? Hannah, would you like to introduce our guest? Oh, did I conk your head? Sorry Maurice. <laughs> I'm such a head conker, what can I say? Hi guys, how you doing? Hi. Hello. Did you want to introduce today's yes, special guest? Can introduce our guest please? This is my daddy. <laughs> and that's my daughter. <laughs> Hi guys. <laughs> my name's Neil Shubin. And I'm a scientist. I'm a paleontologist. Does the kids know listened quietly as I told them about what paleontologists do and how we search for fossils. So let me show you the, the puzzle. This, I'm going to show you something that shows you what I was looking for. And then you're going to try to identify what it is. Let's see what we got. This is taken from a college textbook, so it's really hard. This is taken from. I want to show you something. You see this cartoon? Does everybody see it? OK, I'll bring it around. All right, what is on top? What do you guys see? Fish. That's a fish on top. Now, why is it a fish? Why do you say you guys were all pretty sure that was a fish? How do you know? What did you say? Yes. Why is it? Because it has fins and stuff. Yeah, it has fins and scales. And look at the shape of its head. It's like an oval, and they don't really have a neck over here, and it doesn't make a big shape. That's right. Now, what's on the bottom? No, I don't know about dinosaur. A crocodile. It looks like a crocodile, yeah. It's an early land living animal. So how do you know it's not a fish? It has legs. It has legs. What else? What about its head? It's not an oval. That's right. So I was looking in the fossil record to understand how fish became creatures that walked on land. And in the Arctic, in the North Pole, we found a fossil. And I want to show it to you, and I want to ask you what you think it is. Here's the body. All right, there's the body. Everybody see? And here is the head. Now don't answer what it is yet. I just want you to look at it. Is it real? This is the cast of the real specimen. Yeah, the teeth are sharp. All right. Okay. Somebody raise your hand. Who, who, not you. You know. What it, is. it looks like a lizard. It was a kind of has like, like triangle head. That's right. That's why we were so interested in it. What do you see on the body? Like scales. That's right. Scales. What else? What are these? Like hands. Maybe well, fins. 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 That's right. <gasps> oh, I know what it is. Oh, I know what it is. I, knew, I totally know what it is. You totally know what it is. Uh, what is it? It's like a fish that walks on land. Yeah. <laughs> In a word. <laughs> what the students picked up on is that this fossil, which we named Tiktaalik, has some features that belong to fish and some to four-legged animals or tetrapods. What's really amazing is that this is an animal that Darwin would have predicted. A real mix of characteristics, both fish-like and tetrapod-like. It's what we call a fishapod. Like a fish, it had scales in its back and fins with, with fin rays. But like an early tetrapod, it had a flat head with eyes on top. And when we look inside the body, we see these huge interlocking ribs that would fit together to probably support lungs during breathing. And when you put the body together with the head, what well, you see it has a neck where the head can move independently of the body, you know, allowing the animal to peer outside the water, avoid predators, and find prey. This visit had a profound impact on me because what it showed as a true example is the power of fossil evidence. 
that when you give the fossil evidence to children and let them interact with it, they get it. They got seeing a transitional fossil. I didn't have to describe anything. The evidence itself was what it was all about. So six years old, those kids, a fish that walks on land. So I hope, um, you know, through these little snippets, I, I've provoked you to think about the role of story in communicating science, communicating science both in, to the public and, and in the classroom. And I want to just kind of leave you with, with one last thought, sort of where that sense of story first comes, perhaps it definitely comes in our lives, and remind you of it. It's a, it's a little moment from Peter Pan. Wendy asked Peter, why did you come to our window? He says, to hear a story. None of us know any stories. How perfectly awful. So let's not let our kids be the, like the lost boys. Let's make sure they learn some stories. Thanks for listening to mine. And really, for a Carol presentation, this was remarkably short. I, I think, you know, Bill's sitting over here thinking, "Woo! I thought that was going to go another hour. OK. But it was deliberately, I just wanted to make it a little bit compact so we'd have a chance um, just to talk amongst ourselves. If you have some reactions or comments or questions or how some of these things were done or just to share uh, some reactions. I've never given this talk, for example, you know, clip accompanied and sort of laid this sort of stuff out. So. Uh, I'm really curious um, what you think. Yeah, right here. So the idea of using a story in the classroom is entirely different from how people normally teach, especially at the college level. So have you seen that this sudden shift in the way the students have to learn has affected their ability to pick up the same amount of information in the classroom? Well, uh, here's the thing. What the feedback we get from teachers is this. I, I don't want I don't want, for example, students to study a film. Now, I think if there's a print story that they read that's, you know, they can sort of annotate it as they go. I mean, a film's really meant to be just sort of a one, really one-time experience. Like, I suppose they can watch it a second time if they enjoyed it. And sort of, it's an appetizer for then digging into the material. So what we hear most often in feedback is that it inspires interest. It engages the students. They get a sense of place about why, why is this being done? Why are these questions being asked? Who's asking them? How are they asking them? What are they finding out? So um, it, it, that's, it, it, it sort of provokes that. In, in terms of what the rest of the time they're spending in the classroom, it really hasn't, I wouldn't say it's changed as much as the film gives them some, some uh, case study, essentially, to focus their activity around. So you know, from the, the teachers that you know, that we hear back from, and we talk to them a lot, and we see them all the time out on the road. Uh, I think it's, you know, their first challenge in walking into the class any day is to get the students engaged, to get their attention, to get them on board, get them on the train so that they're with them for, you know, 50 minutes or whatever it might be. Now, I, I just think high school and college are pretty different practices because, you know, college classes are usually meeting less frequently. Um, a little bit different emphasis on how that class time is used, and much more comfortable uh, uh, college profs in assigning this material to be viewed outside of class before coming to class. And it's assumed that kids are going to have access to, you know, to the internet, be able to watch these things you know, on their own. Whereas in high school classrooms and, ju and junior high classrooms, uh, DVDs are used more often, and, and the films are actually viewed you know, collectively by the, by the class as a group. So does that give you some sort of sense of, of things? OK. Yeah, other questions or thoughts? Uh, yeah. So these short videos that you take to mind that you showed, are they primarily targeted to high school, college, or do you still use them for both? Yeah. It, the, the tar as it turns out, um, it, it's, it's, they stretch. If you aim them sort of at eh, a decent high school level of biology, uh, they have good shoulder of utility to junior high and, to in, and usually to the intro college level. So when we poll educators using this stuff, it's about 20% college, 60% high school, about 20% junior high of the people who, who either download or order DVDs or, or things like that. And you know, we're, we're conscious of the fact because we're not, the films themselves are not, you know, you're not, the kid's not supposed to be listening there with a notepad and going, Okay, it's 66.0, what, okay, da, 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 and that's not the, the way they're supposed to be engaged. They are really, you know, meant to be a general um, 
a broader introduction to the topic and to get students into thinking about the scientific process and the questions that are at hand. And then they're going to kind of look at the red meat of the sorts of things, that the kind of information that they might be held responsible for uh, in additional materials. So, you know, I'm told that uh, teachers tell me their seven-year-olds are watching the, the dinosaur extinction film. And they actually like the fact that there's some things they don't get quite. But they certainly get the idea that something uh, hit the Yucatan and blasted a 120 mile wide hole and put a whole lot of stuff in the atmosphere that rained back down. And, um, and that that was the trail of debris that scientists eventually, you know, that followed to eventually find the crater, things like that. So they get the detective work sort of, you know, nature of it. And, um, in those, and, and you know, when I hear about six and seven year olds, that, you know, I think that at least to me, it tells me that we've probably, certainly out in the public discussion, have underestimated audiences. Um, and, you know, in the classroom, it's just a matter of a little bit of, you know, this is all experimental. I mean, we get a lot of feedback from teachers sometimes while something's in production uh, to try to tune it. But it seems to have a broad, it's, it seems to be friendly enough from about age 12 to 22. That's, that's about where it goes. But, some teachers are taking it younger if it's, if it's the right story. Oh wow, now a lot of hands are popping up. I gotta have a system here. I'm gonna start in the way back and work my way back here a little bit. Yeah, far left. Hi, I'm Dorothy Sears from the School of Medicine. Great presentation. And I have a couple comments and I'm wondering what you think about this. So um, I think that we had Alan Alda last uh, week here on campus talking about the importance of how we communicate to the public. And we don't do a very good job of it. So, I think a really important point about the storytelling is just to the media representatives, to the public, through the media or ourselves. Um, telling a story is so important to the media um, and so that people absorb what you're saying. And if you do that, Bill Mars will look at it. Why wasn't that scientist telling a really engaging story about the fossil record? So, could you comment on the storytelling approach to talking to the media and the public? Yeah, well, I mean, you know, the media will come to scientists when there's a breaking story, um, and and that so that there's sort of the news side of that. But then there's also sort of the longer term, let's say, you know, longer feature kind of approach, which might be documentary television or magazine pieces, and you know, New Yorker articles, National Geographic, you know, things like this. And the generally, when you get into longer form, there's a there's an expectation of in the media, there's there are standards and practices. That it's it's more highly researched and more fact checkings involved and all that sort of thing. They're really relying on scientists to steer them in the right way. But, you know, they're generally, you're talking journalists, they're trained as storytellers. The first instinct of a journalist is where the hell is the story, right? What's the angle here on the story? How am I going to get my audience to relate to this? So in some ways, we could be natural collaborators with journalists. I saw that. I worked with a lot of filmmakers before I really amped it up in, in Washington. And I felt that, that we were, you know, kind of cut from the same cloth, that, that, that uh, I love the work ethic of filmmakers, I love their artistry, I love their passion, I love their, uh, you know, their talent at, you know, bringing out a story that would otherwise, I think, coming from us would just be flat and not, you know, if you look at how they can mix, um, you know, the imagination of graphics with landscapes and things like this, it's, it's you know, I think there's, there's a power there. So we could be great collaborators, and it was on that belief but an understanding of a structural problem. The structural problem is that we have an interaction with journalists, and we're not there all the way to the final product. So you have to, you hope that what comes out will, will get it right. And I think there was the collective experience of, of many of us uh, that were just not happy, particularly with television, that the stories just came out badly, incorrectly, misleadingly, hyped in the wrong direction, this kind of thing. That was why I thought if we, if we took editorial responsibility at Hughes for getting it right, it, you know, then at least we'd know who to blame, okay, if we, if we didn't get it right. So, now that, look, I can't, you know, that's a small work, you know, it's a small shop just making a limited amount of stuff. But in general, in interacting with the media, I think it's understanding their job. Their job is to tell a story. So, you know, help them tell that story, and I think that when you talk about you know, our ability to communicate, it doesn't mean that everyone has to be Alan Alda in terms of communication skills, but at least sort of understanding what sort of our relationship is to the media. They're trying to tell a story. You're trying to, of course, make sure that it's balanced and accurate and not, you know, does not raise expectations you know, beyond what it should be or over, 
you know, overplay something that may be reported or something like that. So um, I think when you talk about communication skills and training scientists, I think we just have to spend more time, you know, with scientists in training and, and perhaps with, with working scientists in just discussing this issue and bringing in people, bringing in people from schools of journalism, bringing in communications experts. I, I don't buy into the sort of thing that everyone in this room has to be Alan Alda or Neil Shubin, right? Uh-uh, not at all. But just if you're going to deal with the media, you should, you gotta understand some of the, that, that, what that relationship's gonna be like. And it's decent, it's a good idea to have some training and some exposure to the way they look. Sit, sit in a workshop with a bunch of journalists. It's a way you can learn, you can learn a heck of a lot. But I would at least say this, it's in all of our interests to be better communicators, uh, and I'll, especially, I'll just sell this to the younger people in the audience. Look, if somebody had told me, and this is why I'm here to tell you today, all right, I wish somebody had told me 20 or 30 years ago how important communication and storytelling was gonna be to my future. In the classroom, in talking to colleagues, in talking, in, in actually framing my work for grant agencies, whatever it might be, the ability to in a engaging and, and concise way to talk about the significance of your work, why you're doing what you're doing, what question you're asking, what are you finding out, um, and to be able to do that in writing, verbally, whatever that might be, this is absolutely essential. And I think one of the, the, the most a common ingredient I find of really successful scientists, they're good communicators. And, and so we have de-emphasized that, whether that's, you know, who knows what, you know, there's not a lot in an organic chem class that seems to inspire the power of story or communication, but, um, you know, I'll blame some of that on the de-emphasis of humanities in the development of, of scientists uh, and, um, you know, people sort of avoiding writing, avoiding, you know, we, when, you know we're, we're the sort of folks that, you know, do well on tests and you know, process lots of information, and we may not be comfortable by other sorts of things, like standing up in front of a crowd and you know, telling something that's incredibly personal or something like that, or you know, showing our weaknesses, whatever those might be. And uh, I, you know, we got to work on those those weak spots. I, I think, and I think it's also just a ticket to a more gratifying, enjoyable career, uh, you know, ahead. So that's that's really what I, you know. I, I know this, I just devolved into Reverend Carroll, I know, but, um, uh, you know, that, that's really what I'm, I'm, I'm preaching is, I, I don't, you know, I don't think this solves the world's problems, I don't think it's the only thing to work on in education, et cetera, but it's the common ingredient to how humans re relate to each other, and it's, uh, it's a facet that science is particularly challenging because, first of all, there's the, the difficulty of communicating that information with an audience that often has no background, Right, so you're, or, or so heterogeneous, you have different levels of background. And second of all, you might be per trying to persuade them to think in a particular way, and they might be resistant. And so that's a lot of challenge right there all in, a, in one bucket. Wow, I will try to be shorter in my answers, Dr. McGinnis. <laughs> but that was typical for, for me, wasn't it? Yeah, okay. All right, gonna work our way forward a little bit. Yeah, in the blue. Uh, yeah, I can't see it. I wanted to share an insight I got from someone I don't remember. In regard to the uh, demographics that we put up, um, the insight was that we in the public school systems um, have a certain viewpoint of reality and a certain viewpoint of what we are trying to do to educate our students, which is creative thought, independent thinking, uh, evidence-based uh, conclusion. There's another educational system that views Object, not education, but indoctrination. And when I speak about myself, when I teach in the public school system, but, uh, students that come to me, there is a fraction that have been indoctrinated in the system, which is solely storytelling. So there is no evidence there, it's just story. And you know, illustrated by that congressman, uh, he was indoctrinated with a story and he won't let go of it. So it's just an insight I want to share with the audience. Just to understand that there are, not everybody's the same. They all don't think like I do. If I can respond to that, I'm going to use it as evidence to the, uh, to the Carol Manifesto, which is, um, and another thing to appreciate about your, your question about the media, science is competing with all the stories in the world, right? And all the stories that have come before, and that's partly what you're referring to. But 
there are other stories out there, some of which people hear you know, at, at much earlier ages than the extinction of the dinosaurs, but also just in general to appreciate that um, you know, there's lots and lots and lots of things going on in the world, and we think, of course, science is very important, but uh, not everybody else does whatsoever, and we're, we're sort of competing for that mind share. Um, you know, even on just the sort of neutral ground, even on NPR, science is competing with all these other you know, facets of human activity, and so we, we have to come to town with, it, with, a, with meaningful stories that, 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 that enrich people's lives. Um, working way, for, I'll, I'll go far back and then I'm going to come forward in a second. It's far back, yep. Um, I just want to say, or I have a question in terms of from what HHMI has learned from this particular uh, investment, is, is this the limit of what, uh, of what the focus would be? Or is a logical step to seek greater integration between science and journalism departments to create both better science storytellers and storytellers of science um, at the level of, uh, of training. Great point. Yeah, so we're, we're concerned about that. I, I, and we're concerned about yeah, the next generations of storytellers and, and the media that they work in. So a little bit of, I'll just tell you, so we're, we're receptive to those things and, and people have approached us. Some of the things that we've done, uh, supported some science writing programs at particular universities supported some publications that really aspire to high levels of science writing. Uh, I'll make a plug here for the magazine Nautilus. How many of you have seen Nautilus? Some hands coming up. It's, it's, you're going to see a lot more of it um, soon, but it's really high caliber science writing by people who have a, a commitment to that um, uh, form and they're working on trying to cultivate some of the next generations of science writers. I'll tell you another enterprise that's so far quiet, but those of you from Australia or the UK might know more about this. Have you heard about a uh, journalism source called The Conversation? Okay, that's no hands whatsoever, but that's all right, because it, it launched first in Australia and the UK. Oh, there was a hand. There was a hand. And you are from? Germany. Okay, so you, you found it, uh, you see the UK versions or something like that? Or you, yeah, okay. So it launched in the US in October. This is an interesting model launched by journalists, veteran journalists. The head of this of the conversation was editor in chief at, at both London, uh, 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 Edinburgh or Glasgow, and, and Melbourne newspapers. Here's the model. Turned around and imagine this, because some of you, if you have an inclination to write for broader audiences, here you go. Here is an outlet. The idea is reporting by experts, edited by professional journalists. So this is uh, content created by, these are content experts largely coming out of academia in all sorts of areas, including science, science, technology, politics, history, whatever, and edited to sort of keep it a little lively. I don't mean to mess it up, I mean just keep it a little lively. Um, so thousands and thousands and thousands of content experts. So that let's say, for example, a plane disappears in the Pacific. Well, how do you suddenly wrangle the experts to tell you? How do you find a plane in the Pacific? Well, what's going on? What's going on with the black boxes? What is, what's a transponder do? How do you search the ocean floor? What does the ocean floor look like, et cetera? And they will get a batch of articles from their body of experts and put together essentially that, that framework. Conversation is free. It's one of the things we and, and uh, three or four other philanthropies support the US version. It's been running for, for a while in the UK and from Australia. But here's the thing. It's, Folks like us here in this room are writing the content with the guidance of seasoned editors. So it's a journal, and then you know that's a pretty exciting journalism model upside down from the way it used to be. Um, so I just give you something of those examples. But in general, we have to be concerned about um, developing the skill, the developing the pipeline, the talent of the next generations of storytellers. And um, you know, I, I'm not, I don't have like huge resources to do this, so I'm, you know, sort of sprinkle it in certain places where there's been, you know, a, a certain amount of activity or critical mass developed, but it's, it's certainly something we've got to be paying attention to. And I know, I mean, you know, just if it's not too big a deal, I just ask, you know, are there people here that have done or are interested in doing science writing for wide audiences? Yeah. So there's a, there's a sprinkling. And so it's a great... You know, it's a great path for scientists to take as, as communicators and, and maybe mix that with other sorts of activity. Did that answer your question at all? Because that would be rare um, for me, but uh, in the vein. But you, you gave, me the, gave me the entree. Yeah. Thanks for your patience.
uh, tips for for a little bit. I think there are people, you know, wiser than I about all the different outlets for telling stories. So I was I I was looking at this through the narrow lens, and I should have perhaps made these criteria. One reason to, that we are going to be concerned about production values is that shelf life, utility for years and years and years and years, it's a really good idea to make the best thing you can right out of the gate. Um, and especially if you're, you know, you're trying to explain certain concepts, animation's really important. Graphics and animations are really important. Now, I'm just saying for edu if, you're, if you're trying to serve large numbers of educators, if you're just trying to tell a story, there are all sorts of platforms for telling stories. I mean, YouTube is the most easily accessible platform for telling a story. But there are, um, uh, God, I got to think, I'm now blanking on a, on, a, on a web outlet, but there, maybe you could can, you can help me think of some of these things or spread them around. But there are channels developing for telling stories in all sorts of veins. And of course, you know, science, science is one flavor of story that you could be telling about. Um, if you decide, if you think you have a, a story to tell and you, and through public information officers, you know, press officers, you reach out to the media and maybe there's something to do. Look, video is important because people like to consume video. So, but, so all sorts of print outlets are often accompanying their print stories with video and they love to have it. So if you put in a little extra time, a little extra effort, you can have some video that goes with that. Now you're saying, you know, is it low budget or whatever? Look, a, head, a talking head interview costs nothing. If you're going to put some other production into it, but illustrated with the work or, you know, obviously a lab scene or a field scene or whatever, it'll add a little bit of spice um, to the video. But I think, it, you know, generally, you know, to make this stuff yourself, uh, and some people have done this and they're out on YouTube and as the teachers are tapping into these things in droves, um, you know, you can do it. But I, th I would say f if you want some shelf life and you want some redistribution, so this is the other thing in the current landscape that's, I see it as a, it's a big plus. You know, it's not, you know, we don't have four networks anymore, right, where you could get a quarter of the country's attention on one night. But what we do have is lots of outlets that redistribute things. So the, the, the first animated thing I showed you um, was first posted on New York Times OpDocs, a, a collaboration we formed with the New York Times. But then and it's, it's freely available, and then out it went through other distribution channels, including our own. And so, again, if you have a bit of quality to your storytelling, there's lots of outlets that will republish it. Scientific American, uh, you know, Discover Magazine, various bloggers, you know, will, will pick it out and, and give a link. And so it, it can ripple out from wherever you start. So I understand these are expense, you know, these are significant budget items and all that. But working with professional journalists to tell the story, there's usually an opportunity to make, to give the story a little more legs, to give the content a little more legs if you put a little more time into it with uh, with the journalists. And video is, you know, video is really popular. You think that's a decent answer? Or, uh, somewhat? Yeah. Right behind you. So, when you this result is that in college, and the question is, what's somebody in the company this idea of media and But I actually have two questions in one. What should the movie be in the category as That's right. Right. Now I'm talking about tech. Right. Am I doing that to you? Why not doing that to Right, so the question was, is this a return back to movies? Why not use interactive personal tutoring things that we do? So in fact, these films are being embedded in Pearson's Mastering Biology series, which is their interactive homework system, uh, that we make things like virtual labs, which are inquiry driven, that, but some of them build off a story. So the students are then scoring, they're scoring specimens and things like this, or they're uh, graphing information that they're getting from data sets and things like that. Again, the, mo the movie is simply a, a tool to inspire interest and engage in the content. And by making them available on a massive basis, it, it enables, you know, it's a tool that then is, is in the hands of lots and lots of people. I, the last thing I want to leave you with is some impression that movies solve anything. The only thing is, is out in the public airwaves, of course, people are consuming, you know, they're, they're flipping on the tube, or they're listening to their radio, or they're, they're powering up their laptop, and they decide, what content am I going to consume? And that's generally a passive experience. So we've got to know that there's a passive form where we've got to be doing science storytelling, and there's a role for science storytelling in the formal educational classroom to, to inspire kids' imaginations, 
to unpack stories in ways that a lot of other content, can, a lot of other media cannot do. But I'm absolutely right. If it, I was trying to emphasize this in the slides. If there's not more for the student to do than watch the film, forget it. Forget it. Don't bother. Don't bother. That's just that's just eye candy, and that's that's baby. You know, that's using the film as a babysitter. Forget it. But combine it. Combine it with a really well designed inquiry based activity, and the, the feedback we have from the teachers is it's it's even better. So um, and it's more memorable and. Students stick with it, and you can also just add layers then to what they do. If they're engaged, they'll stick with things a lot longer. Is that all right? Okay. I'm checking. Notice how I check all my answers. It's like it's be a habit for school. You're gonna cut me off? We're, we're gonna okay. Cut it off. You gotta free these people. All right.